Hi, I'm Chris Fluker. I'm the opinion editor here at the Orlando Sentinel. I want to welcome everybody to our editorial board interview. Um, today we are joined by State Rep Kristen Arrington, for, um, who is running in State House District 46. Um, and she is being challenged by Christian De La Torre, um, and he is a Republican. And um, I would like to welcome you both. What we're going to do is we're going to spend about 30 minutes talking about the issues. And you've both already been briefed on kind of the ground rules by my fantastic colleague, um, Scott Maxwell. We are also joined by Insight editor Jay Reddick, who is familiar to anybody who's written a letter to the editor. Um, and we always start with this question because it really speaks to the only thing that state reps have to do, which is to produce a budget. Um, the, lately, the state's budget has been um, plumped up by about $120 billion worth of, to, up to about $120 billion by a pretty huge infusion of federal cash. Um, Starting next year, that money, which was allocated for dealing with the COVID crisis, is going to start to dry up. Um, and there may be some other very hard decisions made here in the next 96 hours as well as to what Florida is going to have to do with that. And I'm going to follow up on that in a minute. But for starters, what should Florida do in the coming year or two to deal with that loss of um, federal money and the need to readjust the budget. And let's start with um, Mr. De La Torre. Am I saying your name right? Is, is it Torre or Torre? Yeah, yeah, you just got to roll that R a little bit more, but you're doing a great job. <laughs> it's, a, it's a challenge. Those Spanish names are, are it's a challenge. Yes, yeah, I am. I am a, a terrible role. But I thank you so much for, for letting me know. And um, Let's start with you. Tell us your ideas on, on Florida's budget situation. So, so those are one of the things we have to take into consideration, many of the budgets that, that are going on here in Florida, especially how, how the inflation and everything's going, uh, housing costs, uh, gasoline, you name it, groceries. So there's many, many things to take into consideration and, and to look for for the community, a better, better fit for the community. Um, check where we can pull and, 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 and try to make budget ends meet and try to create a, a, an environment for the community to say so, so we can uh, uh, help out uh, the community members, especially those that need middle-class, hardworking men and women that go out there every day out to, to earn their living. Um, it's basically all of us. <laughs> um, so yeah, we need to start creating uh, uh, helps funds out to help out uh, in any way, either in uh, uh, transportation, uh, uh, inflations to see where we can help out the community out. And uh, especially in housing is one of the big topics today, nowadays, uh, you know, since far as the sunshine state, everybody's, you know, everybody's welcome. They want to, you know, have that good time in Florida, but it's hardworking men and women that, you know, are, are looking forward every day. And um, um, I think the housing is one of the, one of the things we should be looking for to, to help the community out. so much. Representative Arrington, thanks for joining us. Um, what, what's your take on dealing with the coming loss of those federal dollars? Absolutely. Thank you for the question and thanks for having me today. Um, well, I believe that uh, with the governor's vetoes, we had about $105 million, a uh, billion dollars for the last budget. And we have, I believe, over $11 billion in reserves, thanks to President Biden and our Democrat members of Congress. Um, Congressman Soto comes to Tallahassee every year, and I'm so thankful for that to let us know what dollars are going to be coming and has let us know that they will not be leaving us in a lurch. Um, but if we're talking about cutting locations or cutting spots, I would love to look at the appropriations list and maybe do a little bit more of a balance between Republicans and Democrats and what those appropriations request and look at, you know, maybe we could do the cuts there. I just think it's unfortunate that we passed the budget, then we came back with the governor's vetoes, and then the governor gave local grants for appropriations. So we're, we're, we're kind of playing a, a game that uh, lacks transparency to constituents. So um, I look forward to those discussions. We have many important things in the budget that uh, shouldn't be cut. I agree with 
uh, Mr. De La Torre, especially for housing and um, in these times during crisis. I look that our um, revenues will be up with traveling being the most that we've had in, in, in multiple years since before COVID. So that will help. And um, with our property increases, even if millage stays the same, we will be getting more property taxes. But um, we will most definitely have those difficult conversations as we do every year on um, what needs to be cut. And I will continue to fight for affordable housing and things for my community. And let me let me then follow up. Um, the in the last three years, this, um, the state-backed citizens property insurance company has more than doubled the number of policies that it holds. Um, across the state, we're being told that thousands, tens of thousands, possibly, of properties don't have insurance at all. Um, and well, it's about to get real because we've got a big, big storm headed our way. What does Florida need to do, assuming it makes it through the next half week without a meltdown? Um, what does Florida need to do this time to really fix the property insurance crisis? Um, can we start with you, Representative Arrington? Absolutely. And thank you for that opportunity that this is probably one of, if not the biggest issue that we've heard about from constituents since being elected. Um, before we had our special session on property insurance, and I sent an email out to folks. We had 300 people participate in a survey. I'm sure y'all have done surveys online and it's, it's hard to get people to participate. So it's something that really, really affects them. Same thing has affected me with my rates. Um, the big thing that, you know, this last session when we had our special session to talk about property insurance, there was just you know some 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 minor feel good changes that were made. The big thing that we need to worry about is obviously people need coverage, but caps on what those increases are or gradual increases because that is what's adding more to our affordable housing crisis. Um, that's where I'm a big animal lover. Why we're having more animals dropped off at the shelters because people can't afford their rental rates or they can't afford their homes. So the big thing is we got to make it affordable to folks and um, be transparent with that. I think it's a very um, overwhelming to have property insurance and to, to deal with these issues. So besides the caps on increases, um, we need more assistance for folks when they're actually dealing with problems, especially our seniors, and they get the runaround or they're pushed off or they get frustrated and they give up and they, they come to us for help. So we need to make things easier and more transparent for them. Maybe something like an ombudsman for our seniors, I'd love that. But the big thing back to your question is, we need to make sure that those increases are capped and that people are insured. Mr. De La Torre? I can't agree on most with, with uh, uh, Representative Arrington. Um, uh, and lately, uh, I had a friend of mine, you know, having a conversation um, talking about house insurance. Now he has a paid house and no one wants to insure his house, it's crazy. So it's it's been a problem here in Central Florida, in Florida. Not only that, I think uh, one of the things we should uh, look into is, is the fraud. I think, you know, all these insurance companies have been dealing with fraud. So if we can implement some, some help to, to the uh, insurance company that help out with, with fraud and all these different uh, cases that build up, um, I think it will be a, a, a factor that will help our insurers have that confidence they can go back and go a little bit lower and, and actually serve the community with insurance uh, properties. Uh, it will be a great help. Okay, I will um, uh, switch subjects here uh, to abortion. Uh, now that's something uh, I think since Roe versus Wade has been overturned, uh, I think a lot of constituents want to know specifically where their candidates will uh, or stand on that issue. And I am going to push you, I'll be honest, uh, for specifics on this issue. The question is, uh, since it's been overturned and going back to the states, what restrictions do you support on abortion in terms of weeks and what exemptions do you uh, support, uh, if, if any? And we'll start with you, uh, Mr. De La Torre. Thank you, Scott. Um, well, I stand with Governor DeSantis, the 15 uh, weeks bill. Uh, myself, I'm a father of three, so I believe I'm pro-life. Uh, so I want to give uh, the unliving, well, the still li you know, living, but in, in the womb, uh, that chance to, to have a, a, a chance of, of, for a future. And that we've seen in many cases and documentaries and, and, and actually movies that uh, adopted kids become great athletes, 
uh, teachers, mentors. So I, I believe in that bill, uh, 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 Governor DeSantis had bill uh, sign off, and I believe uh, we should give uh, uh, the, the, you know, the still, the still in the wound, give them a break to live and, and, and have a chance of fighting. And uh, at, at the end of the day, uh, like I say, that's our future. That's what we are fighting for. So we are fighting for our future, for, for the ones that are, are coming in their way, the ones that are here. I believe in that as uh, the 15 bill, uh, 15 weeks uh, bill of Governor DeSantis and I stand with that pro-life. Okay, thank you. Now, um, I told you I would push you for sp specifics on this. Uh, the governor and Republicans have indicated they want to take it further. So this will be what is handed to the next legislature. Do you, is, I guess, let me push, ask this way. Do you believe there's any scenario where a woman uh, should have the right to choose to have an abortion? Well, we'll it's there's there's certain considerations. Uh, um, we should take in mind something um you know we are doing i believe so is, is making logistics and, and creating a safe environment for, for women and women's rights and and everybody's rights to, to feel comfortable uh but especially uh, i believe there we should we I, I stand with with life so um now if 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 there's uh in danger with the mother it's another argument there you know we believe we should take a uh and and see what we can do about that Okay, I think I heard you just in case of the life of the mother. I'll, I'll move on to Miss Arrington. Do you have, what are your beliefs on uh, when choice uh, should be allowed uh, for women? Absolutely. Uh, well, back to your original question, I do not think that government should be involved in any portion of this decision for a woman. I believe that that's between her, her partner, her doctor, her physician, her God, and, and, and that decision is to be made up to them. I believe until we had the 15 week abortion ban, we did have strict abortion laws in Florida where we do have mandatory waiting period. And I, I think that that actually is too severe, but obviously a 15 week abortion ban with no exceptions for rape, incest or human trafficking is, is unbelievable that we are gonna force women through trauma of having children that they were pregnated with during the most traumatic time of their life. And when um, we heard this information on the floor, same thing with the disability ban abortion, and I opposed amendments, and this went on a party line vote. But I went onto the DCF's website, and there are 200 children available for adoption right now in Florida. So when we talk about caring about children and worrying about our kids here, where where are we? What are we doing for those children? We haven't stepped up to take care of those 200 children, and we have children on the disability waiting list, thousands that we're not taking care of. So we need to fund those. We need to take care of those. And then we would also have to mentally health fund the women that we are forcing to give birth to children that they um, became pregnant with through incest, rape, or human trafficking. And I hope that answered your question, Scott, but I'll gladly follow up. I, I think I, I think I heard you that government generally should stay out uh, of that, if, if I understood you correctly. Okay, I'll turn it over to Jay Reddick now. I imagine he has a question. I do, thank you both. I um, wanted to ask you about tourism and specifically about Visit Florida. And I know the uh, the role of Visit Florida has has morphed and changed over the years and it's become the subject of debate. And I wanted to ask you both about uh, whether you think Visit Florida is is doing is is, is doing its job right now and, and should its job change at all. And I'll, I'll have a follow up also about the tourist development tax, but for now I'd like to ask you about Visit Florida. And let's start with Representative Arrington. Thank you, Jay, and thanks for the question. Um, I am in support of Visit Florida. I know we amped up their funding during COVID because we wanted folks to know that it was still safe to travel to Florida. And we also had to go to new markets because certain international areas were not traveling to Florida. And then they did see on the news that we had, you know, the highest COVID rates. So, um, you know, for me locally, I was very proud of our Osceola Chamber. We did like a, a nice open safely and we advertised that, but it was also up to our experience, Kissimmee, which is the branch under Visit Floor to make sure folks know that it was safe to come to Florida, that you know the big theme parks are doing their things that they were mandated at, but also that there was a lot of ecotourism available, a lot of, I don't know if it's agritours or how exactly you talk about it, but like horseback riding, trail rides, um, airboat rides, all those really fun things in Florida that a lot of our smaller businesses do and that needed to thrive during this pandemic. And when people were also wanting to travel and that they know that they could come to Florida and that there was there was options that would be safe for their families. So especially during the pandemic, I was um, 
very appreciative visit to Florida and um, and support them and think now with international travel still not being back to what it is, we still have to be creative and make sure we're working the correct markets to get those folks here. Thank you. And uh, Mr. De La Torre, what, do you, what, what are your uh, thoughts on Visit Florida and the, and the tourism industry at this point? I think it's, you know, um, we had like a shutdown in, in COVID and, and it hit everybody, you know, it hit uh, all major people. Now, and it hit uh, Florida a certain way. And, um, but being the focus of, I think, uh, United States, Florida opened prior, of, uh, or most of the states now. Um, and uh, it, it became a helpful for small business, even though they shut down, they're suffer a little bit, but they're picking back up. I think um, it's, it's, it's in a way we're at that, Tourism is heading in a good way. We were backed up a year, uh, but it's heading in a good way. So I think we should uh, uh, implement helps and and uh, better yet get out there for for those small uh, uh, companies, uh, small business owners, and 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 see in what way we can help out. Thank you, and I, I wanted to follow up with you. Uh, the the tourist development tax, the 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 bed tax, as they call it, uh, right now is. Uh, under debate, uh, you know, it's it's the it's the tax that every every bit of the tax goes back into the tourism industry, and that's been that's been debated over time as to whether that tax could be used in other ways. I wondered what uh, what you thought about that, whether the, the the TDT was properly funding tourism or whether it could be somehow diverted into uh, housing or transportation or or other uh, other avenues. And Mr. Tiala Torre, we'll start with you. Sure. Thank you, uh, Jay. Well, I think, you know, um, transportation is something really big, especially on that uh, uh, hotel corridor 192. Uh, uh, transportation is it's well needed. Not only that, in uh, uh, the Ponciana area, it's well needed. Uh, transportation has been a, a, a headache for constituents. I know firsthand because I have, uh, you know, I have, and I think Ms. Arrington as well, uh, you know, I have talked with the community, you know, and they have, you know, explained, you know, transportation, you know, it's, 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 it's been a headache, you know, and I think uh, well-funded, we should, we should take a look, uh, take a look at that and then see what way we could take the, those funds and, and transfer for uh, transportation as well. Thank you. And uh, Representative Arrington, what are your thoughts on the, on the use of the TDT? Thank you, Jay. And, um, Currently, our statute has that set, so I'm kind of a little bit of a stickler for the rules and transparency. If we change the statute, I'm good with that. But just like I don't want us rating the housing trust fund, I don't want us rating this fund. I think that we have to be transparent to our constituents, our clients, our customers, and make sure that they you know, know that we're doing what we are supposed to be doing with funds. That being said, we have been using some TDT dollars for roads. I believe Boggy Creek is going to be getting some improvements because of that. And of course, I agree with Christian that transportation is probably, you know, one of the biggest issues, if not the biggest issues in our area, and that it'd be great to use that for more for more transportation projects. But um, going back to what I said before, too, about, you know, some of those funds with Experience Kissimmee, they do help our small businesses out. They do help some of those nonprofits for things to the area. So I do, as long as we have them in the statute that these TD T dollars are supposed to be spent on this, I do agree that we need to keep them at that. I would look at um, obviously changing that if that's something that the legislature wants to do or look at doing um, additional taxing on our tourists, um, additional hotel tax or something that way that we could um, get some additional revenues to, to help with transportation and other issues like housing. And Representative, Very, I'm going to barrel down just one little uh, bit there. I think you said you would support changing the statutory uses if that's something the legislature wanted to do. I guess my yeah. question is, is that something you uh, would favor doing? Thank you. And thank you for uh, honing in on that. Um, absolutely. But as you know, I am in the minority party. Okay. All so right. I would definitely be. And I know that this is something that comes up each year. But this last session or the session before, we did have one bill that came over and sent it messages that was for a water project that was a great project. But it was saying using TD fu TDT funds. And um, because I believe that unless we change that, we have to use those for what they're designated for. I did vote against that bill. It changed along the way and, it, and that got changed. But um, but yes, most definitely, Scott, for uh, for um, transportation and affordable housing for our workforce people, those folks that are supporting that industry. Absolutely. And sorry if I was a little uh, <laughs> illegal answer, not my attention. 
I want to uh, switch over to uh, school issues. I think, uh, when it, what are your thoughts on school choice? And then as it re relates to school choice, partic particularly voucher and scholarships uh, schools, uh, the Sentinel has written about some schools where teachers don't even have high school degrees, where they've been dropouts. Uh, and there is nothing in the state statutes that says they must have, they can be otherwise qualified. What are your thoughts on school choice and what's, uh, what sort of accountability needs to go uh, with scholarship voucher schools? And we'll start with you, Representative Barrington. Thank you, and thank you for the question. Um, I think you pretty much almost hit it up the nail on the head with your all's reports in the past. I think if it was an even playing field, I could be supportive of charter schools, but I am not at this point. Um, I'm a public education supporter, and it breaks my heart when I see the problems going on in our public education schools and the things we can't fix. And then in charter schools, they're able to do things that they shouldn't be allowed to do. And it's not the best for our children. We have an Osceola County where um, a couple of them have closed overnight. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate in my community that um, it hasn't been able to be the success it sounds like it should be because it sounds great that we would all have choice and be able to go someplace. But unless it becomes an even playing field where those same requirements are in charter schools, same thing with building and same thing with roads and infrastructure and same thing with their teachers. If it was an even playing field, then um, I could possibly be supportive, but not at this time. Okay, thank you very much. And Mr. De La Torre, part of the reason I asked that question is I had seen that school choice is one of your, I think you said top three uh, priorities. Can you t tell us a little bit about your uh, thoughts on choice and what sort of accountability, if any, there should be for those tax dollars spent that way? Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Well, yeah, that's I, I think that's my top uh, school choice, uh, parents rights school choice. Now, um, I support you know all these uh, uh, schools, especially public schools, but you know we have an issue here that you know we we don't have teachers to teach. Don't have you know you know what they're doing, Scott? They're moving from Kissimmee to Orlando because they pay a couple of dollars more. I think we should help out those teachers out good working, hard working American teachers, uh, help them out uh, and, and you know, get them funded the way they, they should be, you know, I, I think, and I was I was talking with a, with a parent the other days, uh, and you know, um, conversations was, you know, they spent more than eight hours with our kids. And I think it's, it's, it's it should, we should go out there and, and fight for them. Um, uh, school choices, I'm all for it, uh, uh, um, not only that, um, the way the infrastructure is going, so, um, and I know uh, Representative Hamilton knows this, um, you know, infrastructure in Osceola County, especially in our, in our, in District 46, it's been a little bit weird because we are building a lot of houses, but no roads, no schools. So that becomes an issue when we have 20, 25, 30 kids with one teacher. So it's, it's become a, 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 a trouble. So I support school choices and uh, also parental rights. Uh, we are actually r rapidly running toward the end of our time, but I know one question Chris always likes to ask uh, is, is one you just touched on, uh, Christian, and that is uh, the teacher shortage. It is real. It is every part of this state. Um, what do you think the state of Florida should be doing uh, to keep teachers, especially veteran teachers, in the classroom? Uh, and we'll start with you, Mr. De La Torre. Keep them happy. <laughs> Uh, keep them happy you know what uh, um um my grandfather was a teacher uh and and i know for a fact the struggles the the the, the hours not only that my brother is is a it's a teacher in orlando and i know the struggles and the hours uh they are committed teachers are committed to children they are committed to children to helping out and and bringing them forward and i think we should we should uh give them what they deserve Give them what they deserve. Not only that, not even teachers, firefighters, policemen. Let's give them what they deserve. Let's keep them happy. And and I presume, do, do you mean more money by that? or? Uh... Oh, <laughs> of course, more money. Okay. okay, I just wanted to be clear. All right, Representative Arrington. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I will restate the obvious. Yes, let's give them more money. They, they most definitely deserve that. And not just that, our senior teachers, our veteran teachers, we need to reward them and keep them coming back. It's great that we've raised our teacher pay, but we still aren't rewarding our veterans. And um, also to recruit those new teachers, um, when I've talked to teachers, they've talked about the accreditation process, accreditation process, the cost. So I think that there's ways that we can look at um, 
taking that cost down, maybe making there be less time before um, taking the test, just to make it more desirable to get teachers to want to be in our system. But mainly, we need to let them teach. Um, just like uh, government shouldn't be involved with women's bodies, I don't think government should be telling teachers what to do. When teachers come up to the Capitol, when they talk to me here, they tell me that they just want to do their job. They're scared to do their job. They're scared of the parental rights bills. They're scared of the fact that they can't say things that are going to make students feel uncomfortable. And when we saw that in committee, I serve on the Education and Employment Committee and the Post-Secondary and Lifelong Learning Committee. When we saw that in the committee, the sponsor even said that teachers could be prosecuted for the things that they teach, that there was no way to protect them. So if I was a teacher looking to get into the teaching business, I wouldn't want to because I'm not getting to actually do what I love, and that's actually teach and bring my own things to the table. So I think we need to um, respect our teachers and listen to them more. Um, a lot of our legislation, we don't. Um, I know this because FEA comes up and talks to me and fights back about all of the education bills. And um, that's why I'm proud to be supported by the teachers union. But um, we need to pay them more. I agree with Christian, but we also need to let them teach and do their job and let them know that they're appreciated, not that they're being attacked by Tallahassee. Thank you. And I think we're going to let Chris uh, bring us home here. Great. Well, I wanted to thank you both um, for a really lively discussion. Um, and I would like to let um, our viewers know we will be making an endorsement in this race as the Sentinels editorial board, but we don't name that to be the end of the discussion. Both of our candidates have a lot of information out there, including their own websites and ton of coverage by our excellent reporters. And um, take a look at both candidates, see who fits your priorities for this district, and um, make sure you vote because that's what they are both here for is to give you a choice in this race and we think that that i think both everybody has seen that we have some good choices here so i would um like to invite mr de la torre to make his um closing pitch to the voters as to why you're the best choice and when he's done representative errington will give you the last word thank you so much well, thank you guys for having me here on board of this great interview. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Representative Chris Harrington for, for being here as well. Um, don't be a stranger now when you see me around. Um, well, uh, well, like I said, my name is Christian De La Torre. Uh, I'm not a politician. Uh, I'm probably gonna have to use that word a little bit more now. Uh, I, I, I'm a community leader uh, and you know, I stand up for, uh, for my, three, uh, uh, my three children. That's the, what got me forward, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting off the bench and, and, and playing playing the game, as they say. And um, um, I'm looking forward to serve our community, uh, to see where I can help out, especially Latinos. It's a, it's a large community now. They're almost 70%, especially in our district. It's a large community. Um, to see where I can help them out, especially on housing, uh, school choice, parental rights, um, and, 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 and see how we can help out the infrastructure for the community, especially in the District 46. Uh, I'm proud to, to be a, a, a Kissimmee resident. Uh, the most important of this, uh, for everybody to know that, go out and vote. That's, uh, you know, uh, vote, 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 either, the, either vote for Ms. Everton or for me, but vote. Uh, and thank you guys for, for having me here. Thank you. And thanks, Chris. Exactly what you said is so, is so perfect that um, we, we definitely have some things we agree on and we disagree on. So I think that that's a, a great um, comparison for voters to you know pick who, who represents your, your wants and your needs for the community. As mentioned, my name is Kristen Arrington. I am honored and pleasured and so proud to serve as state representative for my hometown, Kissimmee, which I moved to when I was three years old. I uh, went to elementary, middle, high school and college here and um, I'm just I'm just so proud to represent my hometown before being elected. I never thought that I would run for office. I volunteer with the Council on Aging, delivering Meals on Wheels weekly, worked with Snippet, our low cost stay neuter board, um, the Boy Scouts, Heavenly Hoofs that does um, horseback um, rehabilitation for disabled children and our veterans. So I really, really love my community. Um, even if I was not to get reelected, um, I would still be out there serving it because um, I truly love my hometown and um, love working to make it a better place. 
We didn't touch on affordable housing, so I did want to just touch about on that real quick. I know we mentioned it, but in a specific question, um, we all know the 192 motel hotel corridor and those folks that have been living in the hotels there for many years, and it's gotten worse whenever times are tough. Um, this last session, I worked to bring home an appropriation that will do a hotel motel conversion for affordable housing with uh, Mary Downey and the Hope Center, and that's a combined effort with state dollars, federal dollars, and county dollars working with a nonprofit. I think we really need to look at um, more areas like that. I think that that's a great product we have out there is the hotel motels. And uh, that's something I'm going to be bringing more to Tallahassee. I have been meeting with the developers that have done it for market rate um, housing and probably about toward about five conversions on the corridor. And I'm not an expert, but I'm trying to be. And I really think that this is one of those things that could help with our current crisis because we have a supply chain issue. We also have a worker issue. And I know that these hotel motels could be converted very, very quickly to provide safe, affordable housing for our workers and those that need it most. So I, I really look forward to your support and going back to Tallahassee to fight for those affordable housing opportunities and dollars, and also to work on the hydrilla problem that we have in Lake Toho and um, make that better for our community to enjoy and also make it um, an economic driver. Thank you, Jay. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you both so much. And I wish you the very best of luck.